copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 90 regarding a murder. Dansky Kubo, Japanese, was shot during a holdup by a man described as medium height, age about 23, wearing a dark suit. That's all. Rolls and quits. <laughs> decide upon Rio Grande cracked gasoline, can you ask for better proof that Rio Grande crack has distinct advantages over every other gasoline? Actual tests have convinced these cities that their emergency engines get greater speed, greater power, greater economy with Rio Grande crack. And the explanation for this superior performance lies in an exclusive refining process. No other gasoline in the West is licensed to use the patented Sinclair cracking process. Rio Grande's new cracking plant is the finest in all America, and it produces a gasoline that has no equal. It costs Rio Grande more to make this finer gasoline, but it costs you no more. Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl added, sells to you at competitive prices. The sensational growth in the sales of Rio Grande, its unprecedented adoption by so many cities and counties, is proof that you get greater value for your money at independent service stations featuring Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Distant points. 
our percentage of unsolved cases is phenomenally low. Tonight's story is an example of the unflagging zeal of your police officers. Once a crime is committed, they never forget. It may take years, but sooner or later, they bring the criminal to justice. An unfinished case is a constant challenge. We never cease to work upon them until we can write closed across the file. The case Robeson has dramatized for you tonight took five years to close. But in the end, the murderer for whom we were searching paid his bill. How, you soon will see. It is past nine o'clock on the evening of February 1st, 1930. As Dante Kubo and his wife are closing up their vegetable stand, a stranger approaches. Yes, please. You want some vegetables? Yeah, yeah. Give me a couple of bunches of them some carrots. Oh, yes. A very nice carrot. Uh, just one minute, I'll get... Dante, look out. Man putting guns. Please, what's wrong? Mr. Ball? Holdup. Now get out, both of you. Stand out the back way. I'm not understanding. What do you want? Now give me a three. One. Are you giving me a three? Two. One. Please, don't understand. Three. Oh. 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 Oh, here now. Stand back here. Who's been shot? Oh, there's shot here. There's his wife. Mm. Looks pretty bad. Oh, here comes the ambulance. Are you the widow? I mean wife? Yes. I'm in heaven. Dusty and me. There's nothing up the door. I see, about how old? Oh, young fellow. Right here, here's the victim, doctor. Uh, he's up to the stomach. We'll have to get him to the hospital in a hurry. All right, boys, lift him onto the stretcher. Hey, you go with him, Ed, and see if you can get a description if he comes to. I want to question this lady. I want him to go with Dunsky. You can go in just a minute, but first I want to ask you some more questions. Yes, but Dunsky needs me. Now, look, the doctor will do everything he can for you. Uh, what's your name? Mrs. Kubo. See, Mrs. Kubo, what happened after this man shot your husband? I'm not knowing. I'm running for help. Neighbor lady, she's calling police. When we come back, man gone. Thank you, lying on floor. Let's see. Is there anything else you can remember? Oh, yes. When man shooting, I, I feel pain in me. Hmm, let me see. Well, that's funny. Stocking torn and a big bruise, and the skin isn't even broken. You sure you didn't run into one of these vegetable crates here? No. Something... Ah, well, let's see. If you ran this way, you might have been hit by the same bullet that went through your husband's stomach. You would have spent most of its force by then. Well, if that's what happened, and the bullet ought to be on the floor here somewhere. Down here and look around, you find it. 82 caliber lead slug. Well, this piece of evidence, Mrs. Kubo, is going to lead us to the man who shot your husband. <laughs> A little later, the same evening, two officers are staked out in a darkened foul car, watching a parked sedan a half block away. Well, Harry, if that gang of petty thieves is still working in this neighborhood, they ought to fall for the stuff we got stowed in that sedan. Yeah, I'll say. Clothes, a radio, a lamp, and the key in the ignition. Only we got to get there fast. I ain't hankering to lose that brand new car of mine. Yeah, you won't. Yeah, there's a couple of young fellows looking it over now. Yeah, they've opened the door. Come on, flip her in the gear and don't make any noise about it. Hello, boys. Going on a trip? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to Frisco. In that car? Uh, yeah. Who's it belong to? Why, it's mine. Oh, well, that's mighty interesting. If you'll look closely at the registration slip, you'll find that it's in my name. Oh, but you see, I... I guess you boys better come along with us. You see, it, it was this way. We made a mistake. We honestly thought that was our car. I guess somebody stole ours. It, it was the same model. Yeah, that's likely. And of course, you had nothing to do with that apartment robbery on New Hampshire the other night. No. I don't know anything about it. Mm, and you weren't the guys who knocked over the drugstore on South Catalina two weeks ago, huh? Of course not. I... Hey, Harry, here's a telephone that I still came in about a shooting. Somebody shot a Japanese fruit man at 54th and Hoover a couple hours ago. 
This fellow's got a gun? Yeah. I found this revolver on Hayes here. Mm, 38. According to the flash, this Jap was shot with a 32. Well, yeah, they probably threw their 32 away after the shooting. Wait a minute. We're not mixed up in any shooting. Don't try to pin that on us. Sure, we, we did those jobs you've been talking about, and there are a couple more, but we didn't shoot anybody. We'll see about that. The Japanese isn't dead yet. Or you better take these guys over to the receiving hospital and see if you can identify them. Okay. <laughs> Is he, Doctor? Yeah, he's in pretty bad shape. Yeah, we think we've got the guys who did it. Will you let us get an identification? Oh, very well, but don't take too long. You come right this way. Mr. Kubo. Mr. Kubo, can you hear me? I hit him. Mr. Kubo, look at those two men here. Was either of them the man who shot you? Uh, it's hard for seeing. I, I think maybe... He looks like man who shot me. Well, Hayes, what have you to say now? That poor fellow's half unconscious. That ain't no sort of an identification. It'll help, but the rest of the case will build up against you. Following his identification of Hayes as his murderer, Kubo dies without regaining consciousness. And the noose tightens about the neck of Hayes when Mrs. Kubo also identifies him as the murderer... And when his story is shot full of holes by the investigation of the officers. But as plans for the prosec but as plans for the prosec but as plans for the prosecution of Hayes as the murderer of the Japanese are carried forward, the district attorney receives a letter which causes him to send for the officers who were investigating the case. Boys, I just got this letter today, and I thought you ought to see it. It's like a nut letter to me. That's what I thought when I first read it. It's crudely printed in an effort to avoid handwriting identification. But the writer of it is too well acquainted with the circumstances of that Kubo shooting to be entirely disregarded. He says that Hayes is innocent of the Kubo murder, claims he did it himself, and tells us to drop murder charges against Hayes or to go out and murder another Japanese to prove that we're wrong. That's a pretty drastic threat. Any clues on the letter that would indicate who sent it? Of course not. You wouldn't expect any, would you? No. Now, it looks like this to me. We haven't got a strong case against Hayes for murder. It's pretty weak circumstantial evidence. We got the slug in the cell it came from. Moxley, the ballistics man, says it's an old German type used during the war. And you haven't got the gun that fired it? No, that's right. Okay, you file this letter away with the slug in the shell and look for that gun. I can send Hayes and his partner to San Quentin for burglary on their own confession. But if I prosecute them for murder, I may lose the case, and from what the writer of this letter says, you fellows may have another Japanese murder on your hands. Our duty is to prevent crime as well as to solve and prosecute it. So Hayes is sent up for burglary, and the bullet and note are sent to the files for future reference. Nearly a year passes. Then, late on a rainy New Year's afternoon in 1931, radio officers Heacock and Aiken are cruising through their district when an approaching car attracts their attention. Hey, look at this car coming this way. Yeah, what about it? Well, his bumper's dragging and one of his headlights is broken. Hmm. Must have an accident. Oh, still, he oughtn't to drive with his bumper dragging and a light out. Might be a hit and run driver. I think we better talk to him. Swing around. Hey, he knows we're after him. He's trying to get away. Step on it. Hey, look. He's throwing stuff out of the car. Papers. Probably evidence of some sort. Hey, there goes something heavy. Hey, the guy's nuts. He's throwing away money. Coins and bills are all over the street. Yeah, and we can't stop. Hey, look at all those $5 bills going past us. He's going to smash into somebody. He's doing 65 mil. Better try to put a shot into his tire. Okay. Hey, he's turning that corner to get out of range. Oh, oh, he did it. Well, that's that. Pull up. Well, buddy, what's the big idea? They ain't talking. No. Now, we'll slip your wrists into these bracelets and we'll see about that. You can't pinch me. I ain't done nothing. Uh, except driving like a maniac. You're under arrest for reckless driving. Come along now like a good boy. What's his name? Well, according to the registration slip, Sergeant, the car belongs to John E. Healy. Is that your name, buddy? Hold up. Well, buddy, what's the big idea? They ain't talking. No. Now, wait. Palm tree and slid down. Hey, down there, stop. 
Stop or I'll shoot. Why don't you shoot? Do something. Oh, I, uh, I can't see anyone. If he's quiet, maybe we can hear him. In five minutes, the hood around 77th Street Station is swarming with officers, but John Healy has successfully made his escape. The prisoner's disappearance stimulates Castle to greater effort in the hunt for the gun, which he suspects he can link to the Kubo killing. Although he searches the streets half the night, he's at it again shortly after dawn, but the only reward he and his partner, Jake Kirk, receive for their efforts as they retrace the course of the speeding getaway car is a few coins and a couple of rain-soaked dollar bills. And then, just as they are about to give up, a little girl approaches them. You're a policeman, aren't you? Oh, that's right. Why? Well, I'll bet you're looking for a gun. You bet we are. Did you find it? No, but my little brother did. Where is he? He's out in the backyard now, trying to make a shoot. Come on, Kirk. There he is, yanking at the trigger. Uh, I wouldn't help it in him if that safety isn't on. Here, little boy. Let me see your nice gun. No, it's Tommy's gun. Tommy play gangster. Now, listen, Tommy, you let us see it. We'll give you a nice lollipop if you let us see it. Oh, don't want lollipop. Uh, we'll have to rush him, cuz. Come on. All right, come on. Now, now, now. Now, now. now here, here, little girl. Here's a nickel. Buy her brother a lollipop or an ice cream going or something. Come on, Kirk. Let's get this thing into Mark and see what he has to say about it. Well, Mark What's about it? Uh, this is the same gun used to kill the Japanese Kubo. I fired a bullet from this gun and checked it against the bullet that killed Kubo. They match exactly. You don't see many guns like this these days. They were used by the Germans during the war. I've asked the factory to trace the owner for us. I already know the answer to that one. The owner is John Healy. But that don't do us much good. We're taken out his house, but his son said he didn't come home New Year's night. He's probably skipped halfway across the country by now. As a matter of routine, officers checked the report that the gun had been sold to Healy's father in Hudson, Massachusetts in 1922. Mr. Healy denies this fact, but officers find in his garage the original carton in which the gun had been sold. But they find no trace of Healy. One, two, three years pass, and then one day early in 1934, Captain Bert Wallace of the Homicide Squad, reviewing unsolved cases, comes upon the Kubo murder. Impatiently, he calls in Detective H.M. Ledbetter and D.H. Patton. Boys, here's a case I want you to get to work on. What is it, Bert? That Kubo killing. Remember it? Oh, yes. They caught the guy, and he broke out of 77th Street. Isn't that the one? That's it. The shooting happened four years ago. The suspect escaped three years ago. With the exception of an occasional check on the home of his parents, nothing else has been done. I want you boys to get on it right away and clean it up. Any leads? Only this. Healy was a salesman for the Piggly Wiggly stores at one time. That's all we need. Come on, sir. Working on the thin clue that Healy had once been employed for the Piggly Wiggly stores, the detectives set out to trace the murderer. A week's work brings them back jubilant to Captain Wallace's office. Well, boys, you got anything for me? Plenty. Here's Healy's written application for work. The handwriting checks in many respects with the lettering on the anonymous note mm. sent to the D.A. when Hayes was accused of the murder. Fine. And what's this? Healy's picture. His picture? Where did you get it? Well, according to this application, Healy had worked for the A.M.P. back in New York. We asked the New York police to work with us, and in no time, the A.M.P. personnel department sent us back this picture and a letter saying that Healy had worked for them, and during the time he was employed, several burglaries occurred in his store. Mm. They're convinced he pulled the job himself. That's fine. This picture will be a big help. Get copies of it made, send a circular to all chain stores and police departments in the United States, and send the picture to the detective magazine. And by the way, you better ask those calling all cars boys up at Rio Grande to help too. You know that calling all cars news of theirs gets out to about a half a million people. Okay, Captain. Across the country goes Healy's picture to police departments, to sheriff's offices, to postal authorities, to millions of readers of detective story magazines. Then on the 26th of last March, the phone in the sheriff's office in Framingham, Massachusetts, rings. Sheriff's office. Hey, hey, sheriff. 
Did you better get down here to the bus station quick? Where? Well, there's a guy down here by the name of Healy. He's one of the little assignments for murder. How'd you know? Oh, I read the detective story magazine. I got a picture of him right here. You, you better hurry. He's going to take the 1015 bus for what? Okay, I'll be right down. Yeah. I'm glad you got here, Sheriff. Yeah, where is this bird? Hey, he's just sitting right over there in the gray suit. Yeah, where's his picture? Well, right, right here in this here magazine. Well, golly, you're right. Come on. Your name Healy? I uh, want to tell you. Plenty. I'm the sheriff. Well, what of it? You're under arrest. What for? Murder in Los Angeles four years uh, ago. Well, this <laughs> well, what did I tell you, Sheriff? Hey, do you think you can make me a deputy? I have been studying how to be a detective at correspondence school. I don't know about that. Drop in and see me sometime. Sure thing. I'll be in tomorrow morning. Come along, you. Informed of Healy's arrest, Captain Wallace sends Detective Ledbetter to Framingham to claim the prisoner. Oh, sure, Healy. This attitude of yours isn't going to get you any further. You guys can't frame me for a job I didn't do. We know you did it. Yeah? I don't know better about that job than you do. Send me up, Forger. Never even get me out of Massachusetts. I think we got a good enough case to extradite you. Yeah, well, I gamble you ain't. Well, I suppose we aren't able to extradite you. What then? Well, that's that. No, it isn't. We'll go right on working on your case. We'll build a stronger and stronger file of evidence against you, and we'll never let you out of our sight. Sooner or later, we'll arrest you again. We'll attempt to extradite you again. If we fail, we won't quit. We'll go on working on you, and in some other state, at some other time, we'll have you arrested again. We won't stop until you come back to Los Angeles and face trial. I'm innocent, I tell you. So much the better. Then come on back and face trial and get the thing over with once and for all. You can't railroad me. I'll beat the rat. That's fair enough. Once you clear yourself in the courts of the charges we hold against you, we're no longer interested in you. So long as you don't break the law again. Okay, let that I'll go back with you. I'll fight your charges in court. I'll make you the biggest mudgeon in the 11 Western states. All far to you, my boy, if you can do it. Back in Los Angeles, he maintains his arrogant attitude of braggadocia. He refuses to make a confession, and when he finally obtains a counsel, refuses completely to talk. The burden of the proof must rest with the prosecution, for he pleads not guilty to the charge of murder when he finally faces the bar of justice and settles down to listen to the prosecution's stated case. thinking positive. This is man that killed my husband. I have for employment already admitted into evidence and also from the questionnaire filled out in the presence of Captain Wallace. At this same time, Captain Wallace asked the accused to print some of his answers. The accused complied, and these printed answers afforded an excellent opportunity for me to compare the printing of the accused with the anonymous note addressed to the district attorney at the time of the murder. In my opinion, all these samples, both the handwriting and the printing, have been executed by one man, the accused, who is known as John Healy. If the court pleases, the photograph to the right of the exhibit is an enlarged microphotograph of the bullet which killed Mr. Kubo. The one to the left is an enlarged microphotograph of a test bullet fired from the gun thrown away by the accused when he was escaping from officers on New Year's Day, 1931. This gun, we have already shown, was purchased by the father of the accused, and the original cotton which contained it was found in his garage. Observe carefully that the ridges and cuts in these two photographs are identical. So much so that if the negatives of the two prints were placed one on the other, the resultant print would be identical with these. There can be no doubt in my mind, nor should there be any doubt in the mind of the court, that Healy's gun is the murder weapon. That's the gunner. He's the one who stole my money. The one who held me up. It was New Year's Day and then threw my money all over the streets of Los Angeles. Gee, Mr. Evans, it sure looks bad, doesn't it? Yes, it does, John. I didn't think the bulls had all this on here. I'd never come back here. I don't think you can win. You don't? What are we going to do? I don't want to stretch for this. 
Give me seven. Do something. Your Honor, my client and I have heard enough testimony to give us a profound respect for the work of the police and the prosecution in preparing their case. Rather than cause the state a costly and expensive trial, rather than cause any further inconvenience, my client throws himself upon the mercy of the court, convinced that that mercy will be a just one. My client admits that he's guilty of killing Dansky Kubo. Furthermore, he admits that he is guilty of robbing the drugstore on New Year's in 1931. But there are mitigating factors, Your Honor. Factors which in the administration of justice, Your Honor, must take into consideration. This poor boy was the user of narcotics. An unfortunate slave to the pernicious narcotic traffic. Underpaid, he found he could not earn enough to satisfy the cravings of his life. Desperate under the influence of narcotics and needing more money for more narcotics, he attempted to rob the Japanese vegetable man. It was not his desire, nor was it his intention, to murder Dansky Kubo. But out of his mind of cravings, he became frightened when his victim misunderstood his command, and involuntarily, he pressed the trigger. It was an accident, Your Honor, not murder. Consider another fact, Your Honor. This client of mine is not a hardened criminal. When he learned that an innocent man was being accused of his crime, he was so stricken with remorse that he wrote a letter to the district attorney, which effectively cleared the falsely accused man. He didn't have to do that. Had he been a hardened lawbreaker, an enemy to society, he would have kept quiet and let another man pay for his missteps. Had he done this, Your Honor, he would not be in this courtroom today. But my client is not that sort of person. He is upright, of sterling character, of good family. His one mistake was his craving for drugs. In throwing himself upon the court's mercy, my client asked clemency in the verdict that Your Honor sees fit to impose. John Edward Healy, stand and face the court. Before I pass judgment upon you, have you anything to say? No, nothing to say. John Edward Healy, you have committed a serious crime. The most serious crime a man can commit. To have taken the life of a fellow man. In a court higher than this, you will meet your final judgment. But in consideration of the fact that you have thrown yourself upon the mercy of the law... This court finds you guilty of second-degree murder and sentences you to San Quentin Penitentiary for from five years to life. And it is to be hoped that the parole board will not be so moved by sentimental and political influence that they will set this murderer free in eight or ten years to prey once more upon society. For every prisoner released from San Quentin, your two-like parole system makes the work of your policeman not much harder. Causes him, in many cases, to have to do his job all over again. Life and property will never be as safe as it should until greater care is exercised by the parole board in releasing prisoners who have not yet paid in full their debt to society, who have not yet learned fully that crime never pays. Thank you, Mr. David. Police cars travel city streets and roads nearly 24 hours a day, crawling along for hours and jumping to top speed to answer emergency radio calls. What an ideal testing laboratory for gasoline. The police cars operate over the same roads you travel, meeting the same traffic conditions. Accurate records of police car, operating costs, dark car, operating costs, are kept by most cities. And tests of many brands of gasoline have led to the adoption of Rio Grande Tracks as the official gasoline... (laughs) 